I'm Chris Costello. I'm a professor of natural resource economics at UC Santa Barbara. So I, th I think IFIN is, I'm super excited about the idea that we're bringing together experts from every corner of the earth to try to understand fish stocks, understand what drives them, what management interventions work, and under what conditions they can work. And to me, the greatest insight that we've uncovered so far is that there are a lot of really sustainable fish stocks. Um, and that message has changed over the last 10 years. I think you know, many people don't realize that in the US, most of our fish are some of the most sustainable on the planet. And there are other places where that, you, know, you, you find a similar story. But at the same time, we find places in the world where they're heading in the wrong direction. And so what we're trying to do is embrace that heterogeneity and really understand what's driving the success stories, but also what's driving the failures and how we can turn them around. You know, I think to me, when I read the media and when I've engaged with the media, I think there's a comfortable narrative that all fisheries are collapsing. Okay, that's, that's the story that grabs people's attention and it kind of accords with what they keep hearing and what they think is happening out there in the world. And it's true, there are, there are f many, many fisheries in the world that are collapsing. But it's also true that it, by our calculations, roughly half of the fisheries have turned the corner and are actually on the road to much more, a much more prosperous future than we've even seen over the last 10 or 20 years. So it's not just that they're not collapsing, they've actually they're more prosperous now than they, than they were in the past. And we think that can largely be sustained into the future, and the fisheries that are on the downward trend can be turned around with the right kinds of management interventions. So part of what IFIN is all about is trying to you know, learn about those fisheries and bring the expertise from China, from Indonesia, from other parts of Asia, but also from Chile, from Peru, all over the world from different parts of Africa to try to understand why is it that some of these fisheries are still on the decline and why is it that many fisheries, largely the ones that have been measured well, monitored well, and, and you know, have good management capacity, have turned the corner and are now, in, we think, leading to a more prosperous future. So I'm gonna make a claim that U.S. fisheries are some of the best managed in the world and some of the most sustainable in the world. That's not to say we don't have challenges, that we, we still have problems. People will quickly point to New England and talk about problems there, and, and I agree. There are, there are issues no matter where you go. But by and large, if you look on, you know, on the whole at the sustainability of fish stocks in the United States and the economics of fish stocks in the United States, we're some of the be best managed fisheries in the world. Why is that? What has driven that success? I think. You know, there are many factors, but I think strict adherence to Magnuson-Stevens. I think Magnuson-Stevens has been very good for, for U.S. fisheries, and I, I think weakening it would be, could be problematic. I think um, working with fishing communities and fishing industry to help design regulations that work for them, but also ensure long-term long sustainability and provide incentives for those fishermen to engage in sustainable practices. I think th those have been successful. So, you know, there's no magic bullet, there's no one answer that's gonna fit every fishery in the world, but I think we can look to places like the US, we can look to places like uh, New Zealand or Australia, we can look to some parts of Europe even have started to turn the corner and extract those lessons. And it's not to say that those lessons will apply in, you know, Vietnam, but the basic principles we think do apply. So most fisheries in the world don't have good data. They tend to be the smaller coastal fisheries in the developing tropics, like just as a general characterization. How do they make more food? How do they make more better livelihoods for people? Well, you have to restore the underlying stock of fish. I mean, that's the basic principle here. And what we've tried to do in our recent study is kind of estimate how big of an effect that could have, okay? And in most parts of the world, we, we estimate that you could increase food production. It's not a lot, it's probably 10 to 20% globally. So it's not a lot more than we're making now, but at least, we're, at least it's headed in the right direction. And at the same time, have more fish underwater. That's a little bit counterintuitive to people, but the idea is if you have a big stock of fish underwater, they're spinning off more babies that you can then catch, okay? 
So you can have more fish underwater, you can have more food on your plate, but most importantly, as an economist, you can have better livelihoods for fishermen. So they're catching more fish and doing it in a more efficient way with the right kinds of management interventions, so they're making more money doing it. I mean, there's so many dimensions to fisheries management and the analysis that IFIN is trying to do. Two of them that I'm very interested in are the interactions between wild fisheries and climate change and wild fisheries and aquaculture. The first of those really could have wide-ranging effects, ocean acidification and other issues surrounding climate change um, are already interacting with, with fish stocks. The fish stocks are moving, uh, you know, moving north or moving poleward. That's becoming an issue. And aquaculture has clear market interactions with, with wild fisheries. And I think it's not that we want to not have aquaculture, but we want to kind of think about how those two things can work, can work in tandem. Look, as the, as the global population skyrockets over the next 20, 30 years, there's going to be a huge demand for increased protein. We know we can't get it on land in any kind of sustainable way. We can get a little bit more from wild fisheries if we manage them well, maybe 15, 20% more. And, but I think well, aquaculture will contribute to a, a large extent to that increased demand.